Hello folks, welcome back to our recorded lectures for HI-237. This is Marauders on the Seine, the Viking problem in Francia. So obviously we are moving on to a new region today, uh, Francia, or the Carolingian Empire. Much of what's happening here is happening simultaneously with events in England and Ireland, but there are some major differences. So the beginning of the 9th century of Francia is the superpower of Western Europe. How that changes connects with their particular Viking problem in some fairly fascinating ways. Not at all what you would expect. And this relates to the major problem with studying Francia in this period. Continental historians traditionally see the fall of the Roman Empire, the Carolingian Empire rather, as a rerun of the fall of Rome. With the Vikings, in this case, in the role of the barbarians. So this bias trickles into the historical discourse from elsewhere, too. English historians tend to portray the Frankish kings as fairly weak in comparison to, of course, Alfred, where, you know, the Frankish kings are the ones who buy them off versus kicking their asses in battle. Obviously, this is not particularly accurate. Now, another problem, of course, always, are, is the question of source availability. So we have the usual issues of perspective, plus the fact that most of the French annals are written in the north of the Frankish kingdoms rather than the south. Um, there are a surprising number of them available, but they don't really tell us about what's going on in, say, Aquitaine. Uh, we do have some, however. Now, there are um, numerous sets of annals and independent chronicles. This is not a source-poor region by early medieval standards. Um, probably one of the ones most worth noting uh, is the Annals of Samber 10, which are just packed with info. But you also have monastic chronicles, which are more locally focused, that give regional details that we wouldn't otherwise have had. We have royal edicts, or capitularies as they're called, which can show us the governmental reaction to the Viking problem. We've got letters, sermons, poems, hymns, things that give us personal and emotional reactions as well. And of course, we have other uh, sources, archaeology, uh, one of the most interesting um, subsets of archaeological evidence for these purposes is numismatics. We have several thousand coins that survive from the mid ninth to the early 10th century. It suggests that many more were in circulation. So we are better equipped for Francia than almost anywhere else, but those underlying biases are serious. You can call this the tyranny of the traditional narrative. Okay, so the early political contacts, as opposed to trading contacts, which are undoubtedly going on before this, um, to understand them, we really have to take a look at what was going on during the reign of Charlemagne. There is actually a contemporary proverb that is shared by one of our sources. If a Frank is your friend, he's certainly not your neighbor. <laughs> and this could have been written with Charlemagne in mind. Now, he has a multi-ethnic state, absolutely, but it has a... Uh, complicated take on international relations, one might say. So this very often involved the use of satellite states and proxy wars. In particular, um, his uh, conquest of Saxony, uh, this caused many problems, but the one that's relevant to this discussion is that he evacuated Saxons from one area and gave that terri territory to his allies who were either called the Abrodites or the the Obrodites or the Abrodites, depending on the source. Now they're a Slavic group and they live east of the Saxons. Now note that the Nordmani or the Dani had already appeared in the Frankish historical record. Uh, the defeated Saxon chief Widukind had actually taken refuge with the king of the Danes, who sent envoys to Charlemagne to discuss it. And uh, diplomatic contact continued, but in this case, the displacement of the Saxons caused the Danish king Godfred to attack the Abrodites and force them to pay tribute. And this interfered with Charlemagne's attempts to arrange things in the east to satisfy himself. I say that kind of flippantly, but really, it's a serious situation. Charlemagne's, Charlemagne's empire <coughs> lacked the ability to establish itself firmly on a bureaucratic level because his learned class was so small. Uh, the empire itself was also very big and had far too many borders that needed worrying about. So stabilizing things in the east in particular 
required careful rearrangement of the political system and the maintenance of very specific alliances. Godfred was threatening that. He also destroyed Rerick, which was a trading center in Aberdeen territory, and took its traders to Hedeby, a Danish trading center, to get the income from tolls. Essentially, he has transferred an emporium to his own territory. This is not a simple exercise, and what this tells us is that you know, his interest in his alliance with the Saxons, who originally lived in this area, is as much economic as it is political. Now, the situation gets worse uh, in 809. The Aberdeen leader is supposedly assassinated by Godfrey's men. This is enough to make Charlemagne begin planning a major expedition. He learned that Godfrey had attract, attacked the Frisians as well, so he stepped up prefera- preparations. Now, Godfrey would undoubtedly have gotten the traditional Frankish axe to the head if he hadn't been killed by one of his followers. In case you're wondering about that comment about the Frankish axe, that's an in-joke. From the time of the Merovingian kings, Frankish kings were really big at smacking their enemies in the head with axes. It was a Clovis thing, originally. Now, Godfrey's successor, Hemming, was smart, and he made peace. First rule of the 9th century, don't test Charlemagne, especially when he's old and cranky, as he was at that point. Now, it's important to acknowledge that Godfrey was a very powerful king. Our sources tell us he had cavalry, he had a fleet, he obviously had a sophisticated understanding of trade and the economy, and, you know, under him, the Danes constituted a quite significant early medieval kingdom. He's also given, uh, traditionally, the credit for either building or simply straightening, strengthening, rather, a rampart on the southern frontier of Danish territory. This was called the Danverk. As a defensive line, it was used right up to the time of World War II, where you actually had anti-aircraft guns mounted on it. Now, did he actually build it? Mm, Probably not. The uh, Royal Frankish Annals give him the credit for building a rampart, and because it's a Frankish source and people are sloppy, the association kind of wound its way into the consensus. It's likely that somebody before him began it, and he added to it. Now, after his death... And Hemming's death, there were major succession disputes and the uh, fragmentation of the Danish kingdom. Uh, personal rule is always uh, an issue in this case. Um, it would be the case for the Franks later as well. So where does raiding start? The uh, period of early raiding, so from the 790s to the 840s, are characterized by hit-and-run raiding fleets. And the traditional uh, major attack, first major attack, is seen as the one on the monastery of Normutier in 799. Because, of course, you have to begin uh, a people's Viking age with an attack on a monastery. This is tradition (laughs) at this point. Uh, It was easily repulsed. Uh, These early raiders tended to be small groups. Uh, For example, there's a fleet on the Seine in 820 that was supposedly only 13 ships. This this is not Godfred or somebody like him attacking on another front. This is part of the same general trend that takes raiders to England, uh, first of all. Uh, The initial raids largely targeted coastal areas, and that's not a form of attack that Frankish defenses were set up to easily counter. So there are two major targets in this early period. Uh, Frisia is an important trading zone along the North Sea, uh, critically so actually. And uh, Dorstadt was one of the famous trading emporia of Western Europe. It's located on the Rhine River, where it splits into the Lech River. It's probably the largest of these trading emporia. Uh, Dorstadt hasn't been fully excavated, because part of it is under a modern-day town, but enough has been done to suggest that it was quite a complex settlement. Uh, We think it was settled as early as the Roman period, but its medieval significance begins in the 630s, when we see coins beginning to be minted there. Uh, The Franks and the Frisians fought over it in the 7th century, and eventually the Franks took it permanently. Now, until Charlemagne's time, there seems to have been a bit of an economic downswing. So, for instance, there's no more minting until his reign there. But he seems to have channeled trade deliberately through Dorstadt, uh, leading to a sort of renaissance um, for the city in the Viking Age. Now, what's interesting is uh, King Horik of Denmark 
when he was challenged by the Franks about who was responsible for the attacks on Dorstead. He actually disclaimed any responsibility twice, formally. Um, but his envoys were actually murdered at uh, Cologne at the royal court in retaliation. Dorstead seems to have been a special target. It was first sacked in 834, and then on a yearly basis until 838. I mean, think about what its status as an emporia would have meant for the avail availability of luxury goods there. You know, they went shopping. They just didn't pay. Now, Louis the Pious, Charlemagne's son, tried to create garrisons and coastal defenses uh, to try and secure the Frisian coast. Uh, he's not very good at it. He's not a very good ruler, frankly. And uh, Aquitaine in the south may also have been targeted, not just by uh, Danes, but also by Norwegians from Ireland, because we see evidence for similar defensive measures, uh, likewise ineffective for ways we don't really understand. You guys are getting tired of me saying we don't understand some sort of things, aren't you? This is all very obscure history in a lot of ways. Okay, so raiding, just like Scandinavian activity in general in this earlier period in Francia, was shaped to a significant degree by Frankish politics. Now, I mentioned Louis the Pious, so he was Charlemagne's son. Uh, unlike uh, his father, uh, there were multiple heirs amongst his children. Uh, Charlemagne's other sons had died. Uh, Charlemagne's only brother had, well, let's say, removed himself from consideration for various reasons. But Louis, on the other hand, had multiple sons three, and a nephew that uh, Charlemagne had wanted to also provide uh, some lands to. So his sons, by his first wife, were Lothar, Pippin, and Louis the German. When I say Pippin, please don't think of the Hobbit. Uh, Pippin is a classic uh, name that this family uses. It's sometimes uh, Pepin in some of the sources. And uh, they're warlords, they're not hobbits, so just put the hobbit out of your mind. Um, Bernard was the nephew, I didn't have him up here. But in order to find a way to accommodate all of these kids, Louis had to go back to the old Frankish habit of dividing territory. Uh, it's called Gavelkind. Now, he faced great difficulty because there's something new now that wasn't in existence the last time um, the Franks had this problem. Because, of course, Charlemagne had reintroduced the imperial title. So, Gavelkind suggested that the right thing to do was to divide the territory equally. Whereas, you know, can you really do that when one of these kids is going to be emperor? You know, what makes him emperor if he doesn't have more territory than everyone else? Uh, Louis really did see the problem here, so what he wanted to do was to give the lion's share to Lothar, his oldest son, and this violated the tradition. So the younger brothers were supposed to be subordinate kings to Lothar. He wasn't going to divide the empire itself. And the problem, of course, is that this empire is multi-ethnic, and a lot of its different regions have completely different ways of doing things. So this kind of approach actually ignores regional and ethnic differences within the empire. You know, if Charlemagne had still been around when Louis was considering this, he probably would have taken his son over his knee, because this violates one of the cardinal rules of ruling the Frankish Empire. You have to respect local laws, local ways of doing things. If you don't do that, you create more problems. Now, all of this was further complicated by the fact that when his first wife died, he married again, and he had a fourth son. Uh, Charles, and this unbalanced the whole arrangement. So he tried to make other arrangements, and his sons got fed up with him, and this triggered a rebellion <laughs> that got him confined to a monastery. But uh, he got out, and he forced his oldest son to sit in judgment with him over his own supporters. Uh, the specifics of this are very unclear in our sources. The peace that resulted lasted less than a year. Louis promised his younger sons more territory if they put their allegiance back to him rather than to Lothar. So when Lothar tried to call a council of the realm, uh, he was forced to, um, you know, back off his father and stop, you know, trying to outmaneuver him. 
Uh, he was pardoned, but he was exiled to Italy. This didn't also last very long. There was another civil war less than two years later, because the other two sons were like, well, you exiled him, what are you going to do with us? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do, Dad? Sorry, I'm getting a little punchy here, obviously. Um, they were twitchy. They overreacted to his uh, displeasure on a couple of points and uh, started to take chunks of the kingdom uh, for himself. Uh, Louis started to act like an angry father and tried to disinherit them. Eventually he's deposed and sent back to the monastery. He gets out. He drives uh, Lothar back to Italy. Are you starting to get the picture here? There are three major civil wars by the time that they're done. Louis could not leave things alone. He kept aggravating his sons, kept rearranging the succession, and created a terribly volatile situ situation. So the Carolingian Empire is actually descending into chaos in the short term and fragmenting in the longer term. Uh, the fighting continues after his death amongst the sons, because of course it does. Nobody has ever taught them better. Uh, it is resolved with the Treaty of Verdun, where the empire is divided into three. And this is the end of consensus politics in the Carolingian Empire. It's the end of the system as it had existed. The empire is permanently divided. So I'm going to give you a map here. So this just basically shows you the spheres of influences of the three different uh, older sons. Now, these divisions are traditionally seen as having crippled their ability to respond decisively to any problems, let alone to a challenging one like the Vikings. But is this fair? I mean, there are examples of effective local responses to the Vikings in the early period, certainly. You know, there are small fleets that are driven out of the Frankish kingdoms. And the question we should maybe be asking ourselves is not, were they able to, but did they actually want to? You know, was the Viking problem simply not as big an issue to them as it seems to be to us in retrospect? Now, obviously, it would become one in the 830s, and to be fair, you know, Louis did do his best to try and respond. He, these coastal defenses that I mentioned. He also called a uh, general assembly at Neumann. I just mispronounced that, I'm sure. In 837, he was trying to figure out what was going on with his strategy, and he replaced some of his uh, military people with others he thought would be more effective. Though, now, even though the raids had stepped up in the 830s, it doesn't necessarily make them a major crisis. Um, really, the other thing to keep in mind is, did they step up because the Vikings were actually participating in the Civil Wars? Um, I mentioned the Dorstadt raids. They actually correspond with the period of Lothar's exile in Italy. They start when he goes, and they stop when he returns. I mean, the one in 834, the first one, Lothar had tried to revolt and failed. He'd been exiled to Italy. Boom, suddenly Dorstadt's being attacked. Uh, they suddenly stop attacking Dorstadt on this regular basis when he comes home. Is this a coincidence? Now, the really interesting thing is that it is actually stated outright by some of the writers of the time that Lothar actually encouraged the Danes to raid in order to hurt his father, Louis, and rewarded them with grants of land when he became emperor in 840. I mean, if he did this, this is kind of a dangerous precedent, because it would have encouraged others to raid. Uh, now, just because sources are saying that he did does not necessarily mean that it's true. Lothar is universally considered to be a bit of an idiot, um, so this may be chroniclers muddying his reputation, but, you know, we have seen rulers collaborating with uh, incoming Scandinavians elsewhere, haven't we? So is this really so far-fetched? Now, the other thing is that we have another example that is attested to in the sources. So Pippin II, uh, the king of Aquitaine, so it's like a sub-king, really, uh, he's Louis's grandson. This is a slightly later case, though. It is from the more violent period that we're going to talk about next, but it illustrates the same general principle. Uh, Pippin was expelled from his kingdom for failing to defend Bordeaux in 848, and his cousin Charles stuck him in a monastery, but he escaped in 857. Uh, he allied with a group of Vikings on the Loire River, 
to regain his kingdom, he actually helped them sack Poitiers. Uh, Frankish writers were absolutely outraged by this. They claimed he was living like a Viking, that he'd adopted their religion. And when he's finally recaptured in 864, he's executed, not just for treason, but also apostasy. Now, you may not recognize that word right away, but what that means, an apostate is somebody who gives up on their own religion. So the implication here is that he had taken on uh, Scandinavian religion and had forsaken Christianity. Now, he's not the only ruler to ally with the Vikings in Francia either, of course. As they become more of a fact of life, moving into the 860s in particular, there are many other examples. But we've got to cover uh, some of the stuff that happens first. So, starting in about 841, you have what might be called Blitzkrieg, in that it's very fierce fighting, you know, much more purposeful attacks on the part of the Vikings. Speed and surprise are the cornerstones of their strategy in this part of the century. They would hit hard and then withdraw before the locals could muster a resistance. Now, because of the Civil War, it was an easier solution for Louis' sons to buy them off. The traditional narrative suggested that they didn't have any other option. But think about it. If you want to keep your troops alive to fight your brothers, Danegeld might be a better option. The problem, of course, is that the Danegeld doesn't come out of the king's pocket. It was a tax. It was levied on the whole realm, in some cases, and it would be collected over the course of a few months. Suffice to say, it's not popular in the slightest. And it was only ever agreed upon with certain bands of Vikings. I mean, it doesn't do a thing if another group shows up wanting to raid. It also doesn't buy permanent immunity, just like in England. All it does is buy time. So this pattern of raiding becomes very profitable for the Scandinavians. They actually started to winter on Frankish soil. Uh, in 843, a fleet lands on Normoutier and creates a winter settlement. And from that point on, sources tell us of uh, fleets on the Loire and other rivers in Aquitaine every year. Now, there was an interesting incident in 843. Uh, the Duke of Nantes had been attacked and killed by his neighbor, Lambert. Uh, Lambert was actually expelled from Nantes two weeks later. Then the Vikings attacked. They killed the bishop, they killed a bunch of churchmen, and they sacked the city. Basically, they're taking advantage of the disruption, and the disruption was so bad that apparently people in the area were eating bread made out of dirt, according to the chroniclers. So, Nantes is a very good example of how they're not just raiding on women anymore. They're keeping a close eye on the political situation, and they're taking advantage of weaknesses when they see it. So, 845 is the first siege of Paris. Uh, Charles the Bald buys them off with 700 thousand pounds of silver. Uh, fleets start to show up and winter on the Seine in the 850s, uh, including one that stayed for six years. Uh, now Charles had not liked buying off the uh, Vikings with that much money, <coughs> so unlike his older brothers, he becomes much more interested in expelling them from the Frankish heartlands. I mean, Aquitaine was considerably more distant from his center of power, and it was never a very well-behaved province, so he wasn't really worried about it, but uh, in the central part of the kingdoms, he really worked to try and do something about it. And we'll talk more about that uh, in a bit. Now, in this period, we also see a difference in the size of Viking fleets. They increase sharply between the late 830s and the beginning of the 860s. So in 861, supposedly, uh, there was a fleet of 260 ships, that showed up. Is this an exaggeration? Entirely possible, but not an absolute certainty. Um, remember, you do have the great army in England. Uh, there are thirty to there are thirty to forty men per ship. It could be a force of thousands. Now, Peter Sawyer argues it's very heavy exaggeration. He says that you know these ships also carried horses, so they would have had to carry fewer men. Now, the only thing there is that, of course. Uh, there are references to foot soldiers in the sources as well. <coughs> and are we absolutely sure what type of ships they're using? Of course not. Now, there do seem to have been significantly more fleets in operation in Francia, starting in the 840s. Uh, 
uh, 8.45, supposedly there were four active at the same time in the Frankish uh, kingdoms. So if these fleets combined, they could make a larger force. But this continual shift in uh, Viking leadership and composition and location makes it very hard to make any sort of conclusive argument about what was going on. I mean, my recommendation is that, yeah, you should assume a degree of exaggeration with the larger figures, but we don't know how much. Uh, there is no evidence for planning or coordination. This is not an invasion of the Frankish kingdoms per se. Some historians have characterized it as a public order problem. <coughs> Honestly, I've always rather liked that. It takes the kind of overdramatic charge out of the narrative. Now, we even have examples of Viking forces fighting each other. In 853, we have Viking versus Viking on the Loire River, when one fleet blockaded another and forced it to hand over all its booty. Now, there was also a really interesting event in 859 that's just briefly mentioned in our sources. There is a group of commoners living between the Seine and the Loire Rivers who form what the Chronicle calls a sworn association against the Vikings on the Seine. Now, they were attacked and killed, possibly by royal forces. Because such associations are not legal, they are politically subversive. Common people are not supposed to be directing themselves in war. They are supposed to fight on terms set by the kings or the nobility. Now, while I am making an argument that you uh, can't consider the Frankish kings to be completely unable to respond, civil unrest does certainly impair the Franks' ability to respond on some occasions. And the best example is in 858. Um, Charles and his nephew Lothar were trying to force the Sen Vikings to submit uh, when they are, surprise, invaded by Louis, Charles's brother. Uh, this undermines his efforts and it causes him to have to flee. Now, Western Francia is the main area of Viking activity for about 25 years after Louis the Pious's death. Uh, for the rest of Francia, activity is fairly minimal. Uh, there's an attack on Hamburg, which is not really all that damaging, but there are only three Viking raids after that in eastern Francia for over 30 years. And the central territories are also less hard hit. I mean, it is the western Frankish kingdom that has all those handy rivers. So you're going to read another section of... Uh, you know, a great, wonderfully detailed uh, chronicle uh, looking at what the Northmen were doing between 843 and 865. So we'll talk about that at the Zoom session. So I mentioned that resistance kicks up. So the resistance in Western Francia might not have been quite effective at first for whatever reason, whether it was lack of care or inability, but it improved sharply in the 860s. So for instance, they stop taking stone out of their already decaying late Roman fortifications and start to build them back up again instead. Uh, proper defenses can, after all, discourage smaller raids pretty effectively. Charles the Bald tried multiple strategies. He didn't go right to paying tribute. He wasn't keen on that. So, for instance, he tried to create his own river fleet. But unfortunately, you cannot suddenly become good at making boats. The Scandinavians had a major head start in that area, so his ships were not a match for the long ships. Uh, in one case, he tried to play one Viking army off against another. In 861, he promised a group led by Wieland large amounts of gold and silver if they drove off another group occupying an island in the Seine. And uh, Wieland basically forced them uh, to submit and they camp for the winter together. Wieland is actually baptized by Charles the next year, and the fleet does in fact sail away, but he's killed, and so that alliance dies with him. Now, Charles also pays attention to economic problems that might have hampered his ability to respond. He holds uh, an assembly of the realm in 864, these are called the Marchfield Assemblies, where he forbids nobles to seize horses or property from free men because it would stop him from calling on them to fight the Vikings. Now, at the same assembly, he also uh, issues an edict saying, if you sell horses or weapons to the Vikings, you will be executed. And finally, he discovers the joy of fortified bridges. 
fortify bridges on the rivers can keep the Vikings from moving around freely. Uh, the first fortified bridge was used to trap a group of Vikings and to force them to agree to leave after they return their captives. Uh, he later fortifies the bridge uh, nearest to the mouth of the Seine River, does the same on the Upper Loire. Now we have records of other uh, monarchs imitating this tactic, which is a good sign, including Alfred. Alfred tried it too. But we know that uh, the construction process was difficult. Uh, they were often interrupted by attacks, and took some time to finish, and a garrison had to be maintained there, uh, which wasn't a simple proposition given the political situation. So it's not a cure-all, it's just a good strategy when they could manage it. Now, Simon Copeland, who is a, an excellent historian of the Viking Age in Francia, actually has redefined the approach to these bridges in the historiography. He suggests that in most cases, they're temporary. They couldn't be permanent, because otherwise it would have actually prevented the rivers from being useful as commercial arteries. I mean, and that's totally true, because, you know, they use them because then they don't have to carry stuff over land. This is why so many of the Frankish cities in this part of the kingdom are on rivers. Uh, it's a really interesting point. Now, we don't know how many bridges he actually built, supposedly five or six. Uh, Copeland thinks only one or two, actually. Uh, the Loire Bridge and the Seine Bridge are the ones that he identified uh, as temporary barricades, but which had forts on either side that were meant to be permanent. Uh, the work on other bridges uh, recorded in sources may not have been to fortify the bridge, he says, but just to allow troops to be stationed on opposite banks. Now, fortifying rivers does mean allowing the parts below the fortification to remain at the mercy of raiders. And I mean, if you're on the wrong side of the bridge, you're basically screwed. But, you know, we're in the mid of the 860s now, and resistance is good enough to push a lot of the Vikings to go looking for greener pastures elsewhere. And in most cases, this means they simply cross the channel back to England. Now, if you pay very close attention to the Chronicles, the Franks do tend to win the battles they choose to fight. Um, Militarily speaking, these guys are pretty well organized, all things considered. Uh, the payment of Danegeld, it's hard to make an argument that it's actually a sign of weakness. Now, should they have paid more attention to the Vikings and less attention to their internal political squabbles? Possibly. But, you know, there's an implicit bias in even suggesting that. I mean, historians wring their hands, traditional historians at least, wring their hands and say, oh dear, these foolish, foolish kings tore apart the empire of Charlemagne. Um, in a way, the Vikings are characterized by far too many writers, even today, as a sort of punishment for disunity. And that type of moralizing approach to history is something we can definitely start moving away from, let me tell you. Now, the uh, fortified bridges are a good place to stop because that will set up the next lecture rather nicely. So thank you very much, guys, and uh, I will see you on Tuesday.